I would suggest today you don't try and take too many notes. You can have this slideshow. I can mail it to you if you feel that you might want it. And really the real message behind today's exhortation is contained there in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. That's from the New Living Translation. So um, we are going to start off by looking at the book of Revelation, which some people get intimidated by, but we shouldn't. And um, I would like to know from you, um, we are going to look at the four horses there but before we do that if we look at prophecy uh, there's always an element of hindsight um, so today in 2020 if we would look back at history of world war ii so to speak we can look at certain dates as they chronologically develop and then we can see what was the last sort of event that really happened to start of world war ii so you know on the left there you can see 1933 hitler was appointed council of germany interesting enough he was he lost the general election that year but then the council got sick and they appointed him um, no one uh, would know but looking back now we know that was a further event in the history that unfolded in God's plan for to um, have World War II and the persecution of the Jews and so forth. In 1936, Hitler and Mussolini from Italy formed the Axis powers that got him to be more bold. And basically, uh, if we go down the line, uh, in 1938, when Hitler invaded Poland, we know World War II started. If you look at number four there, uh, the events that happened then, if in hindsight we can say if people only knew that when synagogues and Jewish shop, shops sorry, were destroyed in Germany, people should have known what was coming. But, you know, we, we don't know the future, or do we? Well, when we come to the Bible, let's assume we, uh, Christ has returned, and then we look back. What, what, what are we going to say? We'll look back and say, well, 2020 was an interesting year. There was COVID and who knows what's going to happen next this year. Oh, yes. And then in 2021, that happened. Well, would there be a 2022? We really want to get today to this idea as to what is that going to be that event with the red question mark that's kind of going to tell us Christ's return is close. So this is really what we want to look at. So we're going to go to Revelation now, and the four horses of Revelation chapter 6 is in the picture there. I uh, think we all know these horses, but I would like someone to uh, give me some feedback. You can just unmute or go to the chat. And um, tell me what you have been taught or what do you know uh, about the white horse. That's all I want to know. Anybody want to venture an answer there? What have you been taught about the white horse? The, the, there's a man with a bow on that horse. Uh, he has a crown. And what is the general teaching? The, what does that horse represent? If, uh, if there's anyone that might want to venture uh, an answer. It's not I mean, quiz time, but I would be interested. Yes, Liesl. Something about the gospel? Something about the gospel being preached, okay. But we'll, um, we'll leave it at that. Okay, so here's the interesting part. The white horse has a bow and a crown, and it says in Revelation that this uh, horse, uh, ride on the horse, goes out and conquers. The red horse has a great sword, and it is symbolic of war and many people being killed. The black horse has a pair of scales, and the green horse, it is said, the green horse, uh, the, the rider on him is death and hell, 
and it kills over a quarter of the earth with swords, hunger, and disease. Right, so what we're going to do now, we're going to look at those horses, and then we're going to see uh, there's someone with the microphone on so if they can just move themselves that would be very nice please in revelation 6 verse 8 uh we're going to look at the horses from uh back the last one number four three two and one and line that up with the prophecy jesus made in matthew and uh you will see most scholars agree and it's not difficult to see that there's a really good matchup between those four horses and what Jesus said and that in Revelation John is actually referring in symbolism to much of what Jesus prophesied would happen so you can see in Matthew 24 verse 7 Jesus said for nations shall rise against nation kingdom against kingdom there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in diverse places now the word death in Revelation 6 verse 8 the name of that rider you'll see on the right hand column is the word uh, thananos and it's actually uh, the meaning di disease and pestilence so if you would have translated the revelation 6 with 8 as the rider that was on that horse was named disease and pestilence it would also be very correct even more correct so the fourth horse is mentioned by Jesus and he says, and, and remember Matthew 24 verse 7 or Matthew 24 is what Jesus said would happen at the end time because people wanted to know from Jesus, what is it going to be like in the end time before you return, before you set up your kingdom? And this is what he said. Right. So then this, the black horse scales uh, with the scales, Revelation 6 verse 5. The lamb broke the third seal. I heard the living being saying, come and look and saw a black horse. Its rider was holding a pair of scales in his hand. I heard a voice among the four living beings say, a load of wheat, bread, or three loaves of barley will cost a day's pay. We're talking about hyperinflation and don't waste the oil, uh, olive oil and wine. What did Jesus say? He said there will be famines and pestilence and earthquakes in diverse places. There will be famine. We know when there's a famine, when there's a food shortage, things become um, a lot more expensive. There's this idea of hyperinflation. In Revelation, um, there what we find there, a, a wheat bread or three loaves of barley was equivalent of a whole day's work. So you had to wake, work a whole day just to afford piece of bread uh, maybe a loaf of bread it's showing you this idea of uh, poverty and hardship and scarcity in level Levit leviticus 26 verse 20 uh, chapter 26 verse 26 you get this idea i will destroy your food supply there will be 10 women will need and only one oven to bake the bread for their family they will ration you your food by weight uh, but you will eat and you won't be satisfied. Right, so let's uh, continue. The second horse. So these three horses are very easy to identify. The red horse, a uh, mighty sword, and there was war and slaughter everywhere. Jesus said, you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. These things take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Keep that in mind for later in this exhortation, please. Nation uh, war against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Um, that slaughter everywhere, just so uh, applicable to what has happened in the world in the last centuries. There's wars all over the globe and people getting killed and uh, slaughter everywhere on the planet. It's not just... Uh, isolated to say one place in the world there's a lot of uh, life being lost because of this so here comes the interesting part that will be a bit of a twist maybe for you notice here i've 
highlighted these things in the order Jesus said them and we have paired them off and therefore we find that the first horse, the fourth horse, the green horse is pestilence. The black horse is famine. The red horse is wars. By this analogy, the first horse is not the preaching of the gospel. It is actually the opposite. Jesus warned that for the end time to happen, things that will be in place, the first horse, the white horse, many shall come in my name saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. So I want to put it to you today that the white horse, and I'll elaborate on this, is actually depicting not the gospel, but false gospel, things that deceive people. Let's have a look. This white horse had a rider. The rider carried a bow. It had a crown. And it won many battles and gained the victory. Now notice here, in John's time, in the Roman generals would enter a city on a white horse when they returned from victory. The white horse is a symbol of conquest, of someone that was victorious. The color white does not necessarily depict pureness. The color white depicts pureness when it is worn as clothing by the righteous people, when they have white robes. But the fact that the horse is white is in Revelation not symbolic of pureness, it's symbolic of conquest and victory. You'll see the crown is a symbol of authority and a, usually a king. A king wears a crown and he is then the authority figure. The bow is a symbol of might. In Isaiah, sorry, in Isaiah 1 verse 5, it says, It shall come to pass at that day that I will break the bow of Israel in the valley of Jerusalem, or Jezreel. The New Living Translation says, I will break its military power. So it's quite obvious that a bow talks about the military power of someone. So when you look at the white horse in Revelation, what do we see? We see a king that has got many victories and he's got a mighty army uh, that does this for him. Now there is uh, some people who make an argument that the bow has got no arrows and therefore it is fits some other explanation. And we don't want to get involved in all the other alternatives today. But I would put it to you that it's quite clear from the Bible that even though it's not speaking of arrows in this bow, it is uh, associated with that. If you look at Jeremiah 50 verse 42 reference, it says they, they are armed with bows and spears. They are cruel and show no mercy. As they ride forward on horses, they sound like a roaring sea. They are coming in battle formation, planning to destroy you, Babylon. Now, it would absolutely make no sense if these riders are coming there um, to conquer Babylon and destroy it, and uh, they just got bows with no arrows. We know, uh, we, we talk like this a lot of, uh, in our English language, we would talk about a bow, but meaning what it does. Notice in Ephesians 6 verse 12, it says that we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, the powers, against the rulers of the darkness of the world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. And because we are making war or fighting against people in authority, but in high places in a spiritual way, we must take unto us the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand in the evil day and having done so, we will stand. Now it says in verse 16, above all, the shield of faith, we shall be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. So the might of the wicked is in a bow because it's the bow that fires those darts. There's always this link, you know, a bow would imply they are darts because it's going to fire those darts. So the argument that the, the bow has got no darts is not a very strong one. Uh, in the Bible. 
So when we look at this white horse, very important. Jesus said, many, verse 5, many shall come in my name. And the exhortation was here, take heed that no man deceive you. Because many shall come in my name and deceive many. So the white horse and its rider represents false, a false Christ or false Christ, false prophets claiming to speak for Jesus. It's going to be someone that looks or creates the impression to be like Jesus, in place of Jesus, but, but uh, opposing him. So there were arising many false Christs and prophets, and they show great wonders and signs. So that if it was possible, they would even deceive the very elect. So their deception is going to be very, very great, almost deceiving even the very elect. This is very much in contrast with the white horse in Revelation 19, which is speaking of Jesus, but there he is wearing a red robe. And this horse, I believe, represents false imitators of Christ that will ultimately be the one man, the Antichrist in the end. Just remember that Antichrist does not mean someone that is fighting against Christ which will happen right at the end when he will be destroyed, but is someone that comes and opposes Christ, but sets himself up uh, looking like Christ and um, will be in Christ's place, so to speak. And people will be deceived to think it is so. And that is what this white horse represents. And, and, and that interpretation will give us a strong words of excitation and encouragement that we will need as you'll see. Isn't this interesting? In Ephesians 6 verse 12, spiritual wickedness in high places is exactly what someone will be that opposes Jesus, that brings a false gospel. Those people are spiritual, they, but they are wicked and they've got authority. And I've never noticed this until the study. We are uh, going to need the arm of Jesus to withstand and be able to stand in the evil day. This is going to be a special time when we'll need this armor very much more than, than we need it today. In 2 Thessalonians, Paul says, I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by the gathering unto him, Notice, it's in context of the time Jesus will return and we are going to be gathered to him. Same exhortation than Jesus. Let no man deceive you by any means. That day must come first where a lot of people will be falling away. They'll be deceived. And the man of sin will be really, uh, revealed, the son of perdition. He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. Or that is worship, it's spiritual wickedness in high places. And he, as God, sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. It's the Antichrist. And that, and then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. So it's clear in the context of the verses we are talking about an event that will trigger and make it necessary for God to send Jesus. And that is uh, very important to know that this must still happen. Here's the good news, though. On the first uh, horse, the exhortation for us is, what should we do about this? We should just take heed and get our Bible study in order and know what, what the, the situations are going to be like so that we won't be deceived. On the second horse, don't be troubled about all the war and the trouble because it is not the end. But don't be troubled because it's all in God's plan and he's in control. Matthew 24 verse 8 says, these things are only the beginning of the, the sorrows. It's like birth pains. There are, there's more to come. So everything we see that lines up with these horses, um, the preaching of false gospels, false Christianity, prosperity gospel in the world today, the wars, the famine, and especially today, the pandemics and what that's causing. 
these are the women that's giving birth, but the, the birth pain is, pains will get more intense before the baby is born. Uh, I want you to bring you back to this, to this picture. If you look at that first horse, the white horse, which is false religion uh, and termed like being antichrist in his teachings, those people with those minds, they uh, are ungodly minds. They have ungodly policies. There's greed and unrighteousness because of that. Spiritual wickedness, man's kind of thinking. That leads to wars. That again leads to famine and death. And famine and wars and all this kind of ungodliness and the policies these people govern by leads to disease and a finally death. And don't you find it interesting when you look at that picture? It's almost as if the white horse leads the way. It's the ultimate reason and cause, the thinking for the other things to happen. And it's as if death is just coming up from behind and cleaning up all the mess, all the graves. Everyone has to be buried, like this pandemic we have at the moment. Very um, apt description of what the world will be like during our times. So the four horses give us a world scenario and it's like a pregnant woman growing bigger and bigger. But as time goes on, it's intensified and more frequent that these birth pains will come and they'll be stronger. So we're gonna find as of today, until Jesus returns, there will be more earthquakes, more global pandemics. They will even be worse than the ones we've seen. There'll be more scarcity and hunger, more wars. The wars are getting more deadly and vicious, can kill a lot of more people all at one time, and a lot more people suffering, innocent bystanders. Now, the false teachings, even in Christianity today, is so abominable and abhorrent and appalling it's just uh, crazy uh, how people still follow uh, so many of these teachings but all of that will culminate in one event that will be the ultimate manifestation of a person called the antichrist so what i'm trying to show you in verse 13 of matthew he that will endure unto the end will be saved. So the true believers, you and I, will be part of whatever future awaits us until whatever the end is. And we have to try and figure out and get a clear understanding of what that is so that we don't get caught unawares, we don't give up, we don't lose hope, or we don't give up when times get more difficult. I want to show you verse 14. A lot of people say Jesus will come when uh, the gospel is preached to all the world. And it's maybe because of a little bit of a misinterpretation of verse 14. Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. If you look at the verses again carefully, Matthew 24, verse 8, 9, 10. Jesus said, at the beginning of sorrows, when these four horses scenario is in the world, you will, when I leave, you will, be, you will be preaching the gospel and you will be killed for that. People will hate you. So the preaching of the gospel has been going on ever since Jesus left. But... Many false prophets will arise in 11, uh, verse 11, 12. And because of uh, this lawlessness and the wrong gospels being preached and people not adhering to God's uh, ways and his commandments, many people will be deceived and wax cold. Uh, but we need to endure to the end. So the gospel is preached. And in the Message Bible, it's to me a, a good translation. It says, all during this time, the good news, the message of the kingdom will be preached all over the world. A witness staked out in every country. And then the end will come. So 
the Bible is teaching that the four horse scenario will carry on and on and get more intense and the preaching of the gospel will go along with all of that. But it's not the white horse. The end will come only once. If you say, if we say the end will come only once all nations has been preached to, we have to, in all fairness, I believe today, say all nations has been reached. There is not a place in the world where you can't get the gospel. You can get the Bible on your phone right now. Um, it is being preached everywhere. The rest of scripture always points out that there must be something in place. There has to be something that's to be in place. The pun there is intended. That will be last, the last chronological item event before Christ's return. And the Bible doesn't point to that being the gospel reaching all nations like it already has. So let's look at those verses again. I'm uh, asking you to do a lot of thinking today. And we're going to just look at those uh, ideas there to give us a better idea of what's going to happen and why it lines up so well with the horse, the white horse of Revelation. Jesus said in uh, 24 verse 15, Matthew, when you therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken by the Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place. Whoso reads, let him understand. Then let them which is in Judea flee to the mountains. Pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, nor shall ever be. Except those days be shortened, there shall no flesh be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days be shortened. Everything we say here so far harmonizes what we've been saying. In the verse 22, the true believers have to go through this time and it will be shortened so we can take courage. In verse 21, this tribulation never was before and there will be nothing like it. So it is something, a once-off event that still has to happen. But notice... The holy place we all know, I can run through these quickly because you're all Bible students. The holy place refers to the temple, God's temple. It is in Jerusalem. That's why this event is focused in Jerusalem. The people that are in Judea must flee. It's to do with the Jews. They, they, uh, hopefully it will not be on the Sabbath day. So we're pretty much clear on that. But what is this event? What is spoken of? Well, it's spoken of by the prophet Daniel, Jesus says. So he's referring to something Daniel says. Let's go there. Daniel eleven thirty one. There'll be an army, a king with an army. And his army will come and order and profane the sanctuary and fortress. This army will abolish the daily burnt offering and set up the abomination that causes desolation. Does this ring a bell? There's a king with an army riding on a bow with many victories, white horse. Look at the right hand side, Matthew 13, verse 14. Uh, another translation says, The day is coming when you will see the sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing where he should not be. Reader, pay attention. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. I want to bring it to your attention that in Revelation 13 verse 17 at the bottom, when it talks about the mark of the beast and someone who has will control and the number of the beast and you can't sell unless you have his, the number of his name, that person in Revelation 18, same language, and I find no else in the Bible yet where this is used. But when we talk about the Antichrist and the person in Daniel that's going to cause this, Time of tribulation, and in Revelation, verse 18, here's the wisdom. Let him that he reads understand and uh, understand the counting of the number. It's like in brackets, reader, pay attention. It's like you should give special attention and try and identify who this might be. So we understand then from Daniel 11, verse 31, Jesus was talking about this time. 
Uh, for interest, if you look at all the, uh, these, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different um, translations, you'll see in, in, in the message Bible or in an NLT, it says this, uh, when you see the sacrilegious object that causes desecration, where it should not be. The message Bible says, be ready to run for it when you see the monster of desecration set up where it should not be. And the authorized standard version on the right hand side, standing where he should not be. So we're talking about a single person, a king that has an army that's going to do something in Jerusalem and the king. And if we go further in the Bible, we'll see that this event is when this person will make an end to the sacrifices that is being made in the temple and destroy the temple. It's a king and his army. And it will cause desolation. The, arm, the temple is destroyed and the people in that area is destroyed and they will flee to the mountains. The word abomination in the Bible is a strongly associated word that is strongly associated what, with what is filthy, disgusting, abhorrent, and especially in a moral sense. Uh, it is linked with Israel in the terms of idol worship and uh, setting up idols. So I want you to note that for the Jews, for something to be disgusting, doesn't mean it has to be disgusting for other people. Uh, we have the example of clean animals and, and unclean animals that the Jews didn't eat the unclean clean animals, but Gentiles could eat them. They had nothing. Uh, we've got no problems with eating um, pigs or uh, pork, but for a Jew, that will be disgusting, right? So when this king sets up, destroys the temple and sets up something there that is disgusting, it can still be deceiving and other people might find it okay, but to the Jews, it will be disgusting. They will uh, find it absolutely abhorrent. Now, 169, in 1698 after Jesus, there was a partial, partial fulfillment of this when uh, a, 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 a man called Antiochus Epiphanes came and destroyed the temple and put up his own altar there and sacrificed a pig to uh, Zeus, their king. But this cannot be the fulfillment of what is spoken in the Bible. And the simplest reason is that Jesus didn't return after that. Because the Bible says after that happens, uh, Jesus is going to return. And it's already 2,000 years later. But that fulfillment showed us how possible it is for this to happen again. And also that Jesus is a true prophet. Because the test of a true prophet is that whatever he prophesies, like it says in Deuteronomy, will come to pass partially very shortly after, but the fulfillment in total will come at the time that the actual prophecy was given for, and we know this is to be a Jesus return. So let's go back to 2 Timothy Thessalonians 2 verse 1. Brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Verse 2, don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. In Paul's time, they, say, they saw Jesus coming very soon because look at the Roman authorities. They so against our religion and, 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 and they were really hoping Jesus would come very soon. But this is my exhortation to us today. Uh, if we get it wrong and we don't understand, we will get discouraged because uh, we will say, ah, oh, Christ can come tonight. I want to propose to you that he will not come tonight. So uh, Paul says, don't believe them. Even if they claim to have a spiritual vision or revelation or a letter supposedly from us, don't be fooled by what they say. For that day will not come until there's a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God, claiming himself to be God. So the main message for today then is Christ will not come tomorrow, even next week. 
It might not even come next month. Maybe not in the next year. It could come in next year, but guys will not come tonight. And I'm saying this with the greatest of respect. But we often pray, oh, uh, Jesus, we would love you to come even tonight. We might die today or tonight, and then he will come the very next moment. So we have no um, excuse or reason to be lax about it. We have to be in a state of preparedness. But the actual coming of Jesus, there's some events still to happen. There is a Jewish temple to be rebuilt so that the Jews can sacrifice again. So that the, the man of lawlessness will return and destroy that temple and those sacrifices. And maybe Psalm 83, I suggest you, where the Arab nations come and destroy Israel will be just before that because then Israel will be weak. Or he might even be part of that whole scenario where the Arab nations surrounding the Jews destroy them and then they call for God to come and save them and Jesus will then be sent. Um, the Antichrist still has to set himself up as God. There's this tribulation time to endure for us. We are not sure how it will impact us here in South Africa, but if that time happens, it will be worldwide. It will impact us, even like the pandemic is impacting us now. Uh, it, it will happen worldwide. Jesus will return to defeat the Antichrist. And the end in the Bible is referring to Jesus returning the true believers being gathered, given immortality, together with Jesus and his army, which is us, we defeat the Antichrist and set up God's kingdom. Yes, an interesting thought for you. In Psalm 83, those nations round about Israel, the Arabs, that defeat Israel, if you look at their flags, every single Arab flag has got four colors, all four colors. A white horse, a red horse, a green horse, and a black horse. The Bible is always pointing to the Middle East and things that will happen with Israel and how that is going to lead up to Jesus this return, but it will impact us as well. If you look at any other nation in the world flag, no other nation in the world has flags that have those four colors only in it like the Arab nations. Fascinating thought. I'm going to end off with two more slides. In, when we hear these uh, words and this kind of explanation of, which to me is quite clear in the Bible, we get a bit worried and unsettled because none of us like to think about a time in the future where we might be having it a little less comfortable as we have it now or even a lot of trouble. But you can ask any woman that's given birth, that baby that is born is so rewarding that we, uh, at least if we, uh, the, the knowledge that the baby is going to be born helps the woman a lot to go through those pains and be able to withstand them and to then endure and persevere. So Paul says in verse 5 of Thessalonians, don't you remember that I told you about this when I was with you? And you know that uh, what is holding this man of perdition, the lawless one, back. Uh, for he can be revealed only when his time comes. For this lawlessness is already at work secretly. Is, uh, since the time of Jesus and beyond, there's always been false religions and people who abuse religion for their own good and for power and control and who knows what's going on behind the scenes. It's a good thing for us that we don't actually know all the things. But verse 8, the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but the Lord Jesus will slay him with his breath of his mouth, destroy him by the splendor of his coming. This man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit powers and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So God will cause them to be greatly de deceived and they will believe these lies. And if you look at the world today, it's just so shouting at us that this is the situation at the moment. Then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. And here's the exhortation. We should stand firm, like it says in Ephesians, against uh, in the evil day. As for us, we can't help but thank God for you, dear brothers and sisters, loved by the Lord. 
We are always thankful that God chose you to be among the first to experience salvation. A salvation that came through the Spirit and makes you holy and through your belief in the truth. He called you to salvation when he told you the good news. Now you can share in the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. With all these things in mind, my dear brothers and sisters, stand firm. Keep a strong grip on your teaching, the right interpretation of the Bible that we pass on to you both in person and by letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself, uh, God our Father, who loved us and by his grace gave us eternal comfort and a wonderful hope, comfort you and strengthen you in every good thing you do and say. So the summary of all of that is this. We have to endure with hope and patience while being fruitful. We are only going to able to endure the time of tribulation if our hope is strong and we're sure about that hope and we know and understand we have to go through that for the good time to come. But in that time, we can be fruitful because God will protect us in the way he sees fit. I'm ending off with this. There's the picture in Revelation 19. Jesus will come with a white horse because he is always victorious and he will be victorious in that last battle shortly after he comes. And we will follow him and all of us will be sitting on white horses with white robes. And we will be together when there's a time when we will be removed and from that time of tribulation uh, right at the end to help Jesus because he returns. So notice Revelation 19 verse 11 and I end off with these words. I saw heaven open and a white horse was standing there. His rider was named Faithful and True. He judges fairly and wages a righteous war. Not like all the wars of the red horse like now. His eyes were like flames of fire and his head were, were there were many crowns. He's going to take over all the governments, all the kings that's ruling. He wore a robe dipped in blood. It cost him dearly to give us this final victory that we will have. And his title was the word of God. The armies of heaven, dressed in the finest of pure white linen, followed him on white horses. No, no soldier in an army gets there uh, by way of ease. You have to go through a period of training and hardship to be a proper qualified soldier from jesus's mouth came a sharp sword to strike down the nations he will rule them with an iron rod on his robe and his eye was written the title king of all kings lord of all lords and the beast was captured the dragon in revelation that gives power to the beast and the false prophet was captured and they were all thrown in the lake of fire the, this beast, uh, the miracles that deceived many um, and worshipped uh, people that worshipped him will be destroyed. The beast and the false prophet thrown into a, a fiery lake to be burnt and destroyed. The entire army was killed by the sharp sword that came from the mouth of the one riding on the white horse. So, brothers and sisters, there ends my exhortation. Um, I hope in your further studies you will also uh, gain more wisdom as to help you prepare and let us all be together strong in whatever future awaits us. But the return of Jesus is indeed much closer uh, and uh, the time will be shortened for our behalf. Let us be strong. Amen.